Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Sedums have succulent leaves that can give a different look to your flower garden. Today, we're going to learn about some great sedum options. Also, we are spraying a peach tree. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plots. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining us today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis, and Mr. D will be joining me later. Hi, right, Joellen. We're going to talk about sedums today. Yes. Right? And I know you like talking about sedums. Oh, yes. They're, they're <laughs> a, a, you know, it's a very large group of plants. Okay. They all have succulent leaves and fleshy stems. Okay. They're found throughout the northern hemisphere from the Arctic down to the equator. Wow. And sometimes Huge over branch. the equator, they're in Africa and South America in the South Hemisphere also. Wow, how about that? Okay. So there's a large group of them. They have very, but you know, with scientific uh, data going on and all yeah. the research where we get to really know what plants are made of and how they are related to each other, they've been broken up into several genuses since Carl Linnaeus found them in okay. 1753. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so they've been around for a long it's time. A long time. Yeah. And, and they've been a, a popular crop for a very long time. Okay. Um, let's see, they like full sun to okay. part shade. So mm -hmm. all of them like a lot of sun. And their common name, stone crop, <laughs> refers to where they're kind of found in nature, which is they grow amongst rocks. Okay. So you got to kind of think about that when you're planting them in your yard. Uh, you know, that's why they do uh, also do well as container plants because they like to be well drained. Got it. You know, that's like capitalized, underlined, and highlighted. <laughs> you know, well, well drained. drained. Yes, yeah. uh, they they do like that. Okay. Um, they are all different kinds, though. Some of them are perennial, which means they come back every year. Some of them are biannual, which means they live for two growing seasons and then they die. And some of them are annual, which means they live only one growing season. So there's all different kinds that mm -hmm. you can find. Um, they bloom in the summer and in the fall. Nice. And basically, we group them in two different categories, the tall ones and the short ones. Okay. The short <laughs> ones are usually called sedums, and they're only a few inches tall. And this is a good example of uh, a short sedum, some of the short sedums. They're only a few inches tall. Some of them are all, maybe only an inch or so tall and you know, up to maybe six inches tall. Okay. So they're very, very, very small sedums and they grow on the ground. Um, also, sometimes you can, they oh, attach, they attach, see the roots? Wow, yeah. They uh, can root along mm. the stem. That's why they spread. So okay. they keep the stems will fall over, attach and grow roots into the ground and then they just keep going. So that's how you, it's easy to propagate them like that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, real fine roots Real too. fine roots, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, they, that's about, they're, they're very easy to, to break off and, and oh, attach cool. to the soil and grow. Okay. The, they're short ones, there's a lot of different kinds of them. Uh, Reflexum, which has got spruce-like green foliage, which I think that's what this one is. There wasn't a tag on it. Uh, but that this is that reminds me of this one, uh, the spruce-like foliage. There's one called Angelina, which has mm. a yellow yellow training one. It like zones five through nine, okay. so it's a little bit warmer. All right. I used to have this planted outside, and my garden has gotten gone from full sun to kind of shady. And in the winter, over winter, one winter, I it, it got too shady for it, and it was too wet. Oh, okay. So that yeah. that's why I'm saying well-drained well soil. Right, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Tenaritum, woodland stone crop, zones four through eight. Uh, Spirium, two row stone crop, one of the popular variety of that is called Dragon's Blood, it's zone four through nine. Okay. And many, many, many others that I can't even, those are the, some of the more popular okay. ones that you see. All right. Uh, the taller ones are uh, almost up to two feet. So they still don't get very yeah, tall. Um, 
that are known around here, and they're reclassified in a genus called Hylotelephium. Mm. Uh, and the, probably the most popular one, a spectacle, is the most popular sedum with varieties called Autumn Joy. Oh, remember, we talk about Autumn Joy all the that. time, that's Autumn Fire, uh -huh. uh, Brilliant. Those are probably the most popular uh, sedums out there, what most people think of when right. they think of sedums besides these small, roll growing okay. ones. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and then, of course, there is a native sedum here. About that. The native one is, like, it goes with the taller ones. It's, it's the second category of the taller ones, but it's Telephoides, and it's native <laughs> to the U.S., found Georgia to Illinois and up to New York. So pretty good range. Pretty good range, mm. yeah. And probably rocky, well-drained sites mm -hmm. is where you'll find it. Okay. Now, what, what have we talked about? What do you think is the most common problem that people have with <laughs> Sedums. It's it, the disease of rots. Uh -huh. Any kind of stem rots, yeah. uh, root rots. From and overwatering? It, from overwatering uh -huh. sure. and from uh, yeah. soil that is too heavy and stays wet too long. Yeah, that makes sense. And a lot of times you'll say, oh, well, it, let, it grew so fine all during the summer, but in the over winter it didn't last. Winter is our rainy, cold time. <laughs> And so that's, if you're going to have problems with sedums, it's going to be through the winter in this part of the country. Okay. Uh, in zone, in, in mid-south here, because our soils are very tight, and when they get wet, they stay wet, and they don't drain well, then you get problems with rot. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes that's why people put them in containers. They do great in containers. They look good in containers. Yeah. yeah. And they look very nice and good for the tabletops or mm -hmm. somewhere on your patio. And I've seen those. Yeah, and little dishes. Little dishes. Right. And they sell them a lot as indoor plants. Because think about it. If you have a bright, sunny place indoors yeah. in a container, how often do most people want to water something? <laughs> right, very, right. very. They, they yeah. tend to, to thrive on neglect is right. what I call right. that. Now, that's a good point. That's a good point. So that's, that's sure. why they are very popular as indoor plants okay. also. That's a good point. There, there are pest problems with them. Uh -huh. And guess what likes them? Deer. Ah. Deer, chipmunks, see them? squirrels, Jeez. voles, my, my native little voles, yes. <laughs> um, what? They, but, but, and then they also get bugs, and they get, they'll get mealy bugs, okay. and they'll get snails and slugs. But where are snails and slugs mostly found? Here we go, yeah. In a more shady yeah. environment. Shady, moist. And yeah. so, you know, I think when they get mealy bugs also, there's not enough air circulation okay, okay. and it's more shady. Mm -hmm. So the, the plant is under stress because it likes full sun and well-drained area. Right. And you mm -hmm. put it in a garden in a, a nice organic soil that it doesn't really, it, these like, you know, will grow between rocks. So, you know, nice organic soil is kind of foreign to most sedums. Mm, okay. And so you'll get the mealy bugs and the snails and the slugs. Um, and scale too. Wow. And, and that's a sign that the plant is under stress and doesn't like that environment, so move it. Move it, okay, got it. Yeah, Aww. move it. You can treat it, but I, I would just move it because it's, uh, Mother Nature kind of takes care of things, especially mealybugs. I had mealybugs on them because they were grown in a greenhouse and I've set them outside, mealybugs are gone. Okay. So I mean, sometimes Mother Nature will take care of it when you put it in the right <laughs> environment. And when, you, when is the best time to plant? I'd say spring is probably the best time oh, to get it established. Yeah, okay. Because if winter is our hardest time of mm -hmm. the year for the sedums, it's better for them to get well established through the growing season. So plant them in the spring. Okay. And let them get uh, started. And of course, succulents, because they're, they're such big fleshy stems on them, they will actually tell you when they want water. Uh, oh, I like that. They'll, they'll kind of start <laughs> shrinking, uh -huh. you know, and maybe slightly curling, and you'll go, oh, you need some water, and then they'll get back to being succulent and, fr and, okay. and, and <laughs> turgid again, so, yeah, so sometimes they will tell you when they want some water, hmm. and don't over-fertilize them. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, do they have to be fertilized? Well, actually, not really, not really? Yeah, I um, so. but over-fertilizing them will cause them to especially the, t the, the autumn joys and the, the taller yeah. ones, they, you know, they bloom in the fall, so they're gonna send up this large uh, stem with a, 
big seed head on the top. Okay. If you fertilize it too much, that's going to grow too tall and it's going to be weak because of over fertilized, over stimulated by the okay. fertilizer. It gotcha. won't be a nice short stocky stem for that flower head. And then when the flower heads get on there and they start to bloom, they may fall, they over. fall over. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. So yeah. over fertilizing okay. is really not good for okay. sedums. They like to, they thrive on neglect. They're good. Neglect. Neglect. Like it. I like it. Hey, thank you, Joe. We can tell you like that. Appreciate it. <laughs> Do be careful when you're using weed eaters around plant material. Weed eaters can kick up rocks and debris that can injure your eyes and your face. And as you can see, a piece of mulch was actually impaled into this leaf of this canna, which is why it is always always a good idea to have on glasses or safety goggles when you're using a weed eater. Again, you don't want to injure your eyes, you don't want to injure your face, and you definitely don't want to injure your plant material. Be careful, folks. All right, Mr. D. Talk about spraying. We're going to talk about spraying trees. Peach trees. Right? That's right. Before I get into the actual spraying demonstration, I want to talk a little bit about safety. Uh, Probably the best thing you can do where safety is concerned first is to read the label. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And near the top of the label, after it tells <laughs> you what we've got and the active ingredients and all of that, it's going to tell you what to wear. Right. Never will you see on the pesticide label telling you to wear shorts, t-shirts, and flip-flops. This is true. They're always going to tell you to wear a hat, to wear safety glasses, mm -hmm. to, to wear rubber gloves, uh -huh. uh, long sleeve shirt, right. long pants and uh, shoes or boots and uh, so that's you ready to go i'm ready to go, ready and, to go. And, and i'm doing this not just because of the label but because i've sprayed enough to know that sometimes the wind changes and mm -hmm. sometimes it drifts on you and and i mean i've got to go 360 degrees around this tree to get it sprayed if there's any wind at all at some point i'm going to be wow. downwind yeah. so i want some protective gear on right. if you get some on you wash it off immediately just go wash it off soap and water if you need to take a shower take a shower okay and and and, and you know wash your clothes but uh, is that pretty soon after pretty soon if it, especially if it's on your skin yeah, right. if it gets on your skin yes okay. very soon afterwards you need to go on and get it off of it uh most of the pesticides we're talking about or all of them are not restricted use pesticides so they're not that dangerous for homeowners to use if you follow that label okay. label instructions okay all right uh, I've already gotten my sprayer mixed up here. This this tree is uh, about what eight feet tall, a little little over eight feet tall, the tallest limb, and it's about eight feet in diameter. So uh, that tells me that I'm probably going to need to mix up about a half gallon to a gallon of material to okay. spray. Now, that's important to know because you don't want to mix up more than you really need. You want to run out when you're spraying. You don't want to have any left over because you don't want to store it. It can clog up your sprayer. Right. It may become inactivated and not work for you. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things you want to finish up spraying. Okay. You know, when, when you when do you, enough to spray it out. That's right. Do enough, enough to spray it out. Right. Uh, because this peach tree still has some blooms on it, I am not going to apply an insecticide yeah. in this first spray. Uh, I'm going to only apply fungicide. I've got a spreader sticker mixed in there too to make it stick to the limbs. I'm going to spray almost to the point of runoff. Uh, I'm going to direct my spray to the lower and up both, both sides of the leaves if I can. I'm going to also go down and spray the base of the tree. And, and I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get brown rot. Brown rot is the number one fungal disease on peaches, plums, and nectarines and it can destroy you if you don't control mm -hmm. brown rot. So uh, we've got wind at about four miles an hour, which is good. Uh, so that's considered to be okay. The best right. is no wind right. or very little yeah. wind. Uh, that's almost impossible right. to happen. If it's spraying, if the wind's blowing more than 10 miles an hour, 10 or 15 miles an hour, you probably ought not to be spraying. You probably need to put it off. You know, if you do spray when you know you're gonna get spray on you, you need a face mask too. Wow. You need a face mask. Wow. So you, gotta don't, be you don't want to breathe any of this yeah. stuff and you don't want to get it on your skin. Got to be careful, folks. No. Okay, let's get to it. All right, let's do it. Give me a little pressure here. Okay. Uh. 
All right, that ought to do. That ought to do. I, can, I can hear it. A flat fan nozzle is a, a good uh, nozzle to use when you're spraying fruit trees. Let's see what we've got here. It's, this tree is really easy to spray because it's been pruned well. The hmm. center is opened up. Yeah. If it had not been sprayed or if it had not been uh, pruned well, it would be almost impossible to get my spray mixture on these leaves. That's so a this good is, open center. It's opened up and, and I can, it's very easy to get, to get good coverage on this tree. Wow. Let me go on and move on around here. That's a great illustration. You don't have to spray until it runs off. Spray it almost to the point of runoff. Turn my wand over. Spray in the underside. I want to make sure I spray the trunk and lower limbs because those fungal spores can attach themselves anywhere. Now, I only am using fungicide. You see that I uh, saw a honeybee fly there. This fungicide will not hurt honeybees. You can buy home orchard sprays that are already pre-mixed. It's very important that you do not use a pre-mixed home orchard spray while the plant is blooming because it already has the insecticide in it. Right. The fungicide that I'm using is captan. I could also use sulfur or I could use chlorothalonil. Mm -hmm. Either one of those fungicides work well. But as soon as all the petals have fallen off, I'm going to add an insecticide into the mix. Now, with peaches, plums, and nectarines, I have a choice between malathion and carbaryl. With apples and pears, I only, my only choice is malathion because carbaryl, if used within 21 days after the bloom, will cause apples and pears to abort their crop. So you don't want to do that. Most home orchard sprays have malathion. Most, most of the pre-mixed ones have malathion in them. Most of them have malathion and captan. Mm -hmm. Pretty important to use a spreader sticker. You can use a commercial spreader sticker or just use detergent. A <laughs> tablespoon of detergent, teaspoon or a tablespoon of, of detergent will do will do just as well. Oh yeah, good old liquid joy or some done will do mm -hmm. just fine. And while you're doing it, Mr. D, you can mention about the orchard spray guide that can definitely help you That's out. That's right. I, I I got the information I've been giving you. All of it came from the Home Orchard Spray Guide for the state of Tennessee. Uh, Chris has them in his office. Uh -huh. uh, you can go to UT's website and get them, or you can simple, simply Google uh, or use a search engine to and, and, and list Home Orchard Spray Guide for whatever state you're in. If you're in Mississippi or Kentucky, I would encourage you to go to that state's land grant institution. Now, what I'm doing here needs to be done every seven to ten days. Wow. So what if, if it uh, rains in between one of those, Mr. D? If it rains, then that application has been erased. Oh, man. And you need to, as soon as possible, redo it. As soon as possible. As soon okay. as possible, redo it, because if you wait two or three days, those two or three days, that tree is unprotected. Right. Because like you always say, right, if you have plum, peaches, and nectarines, you're going to have to do some spraying, right? You are. Yeah. I promise you. There's nothing that I know of organic that will <laughs> prevent plum oh curculio and brown rot. Oh, boy. If you know of something that will, let me know. And be aware, I've already tried pretty much everything. If you have something in your on your mind that you think will work, <laughs> You know, I've probably already heard it. I've been doing this for about 35 years. Oh, I think you'll know a little something about that. Well, I think we've got that one sprayed for now. It's clouding up. 
going to may rain in a little while. We may need to do this again in a couple hours, but maybe not. All right. Well, we appreciate that demonstration, Mr. D. Let's welcome. All right. It's time to start putting in the vegetables that go in after the frost here in the square foot garden. And this year we are participating in the Tennessee Home Garden Variety Trials. And so I have two different bush beans here. One is the Antigua and the other one is the Dolcina. We're gonna be trying these next to each other and we'll be creating a report for University of Tennessee as part of this, but figured we could do it here. The plan that I have is that we're going to plant the first uh, trial here in these two squares, one in, of each kind. Then in two weeks, we'll plant these over here and that'll give the spinach time to mature and get picked. And then we will plant the last one here. So we're gonna plant at two week intervals to kind of spread out the harvest since bush beans tend to come all at the same time. With bush beans, you wanna plant nine plants to a square. And so I'm just gonna loosen up the soil here and I'm just gonna go ahead and make nine little holes right here. We'll go ahead and plant the, this back one in Antigua. So we'll just cover those up. And now we'll plant the other one. And in two weeks, we'll plant the next set of squares. All right, Joel, are you ready? Yes. It's a Q&A segment. These are great questions. Very good questions. All right, so let's get to the first one. Here's our first viewer email. Can garlic be started in a flower pot and transplanted into the ground? This is Tony on YouTube. So what do you think about that? What's well, an interesting question? It is an interesting yeah, question. Isn't it good? Um, yeah. But yes, of course. Yes. Of course you can. And the only thing is if depending on what the size of pot is, if he gets roots that are circling, just break up the roots to make sure they stop that circling when you plant it in the ground. Right, yeah. So that's the only question I would have. Yeah, make sure mm -hmm. you had a big enough pot. Yeah. And you know, plant it at the right depth. Right, right in the pot and then of course when you transplant into the ground you want to make sure you get as much of those roots out of the pot as you possibly can yeah before you get it in the ground yeah all right good drainage you know good organic material so tony yeah go ahead and do that yes it's the answer all right here's our next viewer email last year i planted six cabbages and six broccoli i used some shake and feed fertilizer in the holes then four to five weeks later I gave them some more fertilizer, which I discovered was 12 for 8. They produced large leaves, but no heads or florets. Did I ruin my cabbage and broccoli crop by over fertilizing? Elizabeth in Bahalia, Mississippi. So, Joellen. Well, the, the, mm. the 12 for 8 bothers me because 12 is nitrogen. So she, she was really telling the plant with the nitrogen to grow lots of leaves. Lots of foliage. Yep. And which was what she got. The middle number, four, which is the phosphorus, which is, should have been the highest mm -hmm. number, because that is what's going to uh, set fruit right. in flowers. Right. So that's, I think it's the type of fertilizer she used more than anything. Plus, I mean, once she fertilized it once with the, the shaking, the shaking I, I, I should have that's been it. Right. She right. shouldn't have done anything else. I think they will do just fine uh, without any more fertilizing. But yeah. And especially the fertilizer she used with the nitrogen being higher than mm -hmm. anything else, that's why she got lots of foliage. I agree with that. The shaking feet was probably enough. Just enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you followed that up, you know, just a few weeks later, really, you know, with 12 for 8. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's a bit much. Yeah. All right. So that's why you have no heads. Yeah. Florets. Yeah. Just foliage. Just foliage. <laughs> just foliage. The nitrogen produces lots of foliage. All right. So at this point on, Miss Elizabeth, no more fertilizing. <laughs> No fertilizing. No fertilizing, just keep it watered and let's see what happens. Yeah. Right. Give it a shot. Okay. Thank you for that question. Here's our next via email. Four o'clocks take over my flower beds every year. I've tried digging them up or cutting them off as they appear. What can I do to get rid of four o'clocks in my beds? This is Janetta from Memphis, Tennessee. You know about those four o'clocks, don't you? Yes. They I've are had pretty, some, though. They, they are pretty. Yeah, they're pretty, though. But yeah. after a while, you get tired of them and you want something <laughs> yeah. else. Okay. But by that time, you probably have a good seed bank uh -huh. in the sure. ground. I'm sure. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's probably what she's dealing Ooh. with right now. And, you know, I've pulled them, and sometimes those tap roots of, of those are Ooh. pretty, you know, substantial, so you don't yeah. always get the whole root out of the ground. Uh -huh. um, 
and you can use glyphosate of some kind, but you got to be careful with other things in there. So you might want to do some kind of wipe technique or be very careful when you're spraying it. But see, I like to sponge and I yeah. know people have different techniques, but I like the little sponge with the, you know, wear your, your rubber gloves and sponge some Roundup and glyphosate on there and then just touch the leaves. Yeah, I like that method. Um, I know people have done, uh, they wear a plastic glove and mm -hmm. then they wear a cotton glove. Yeah, Mr. D talks a lot dip, about that one. Dip that one and, right. and just, I don't know. It, it, either way, trying to get some kind of wicking action. And I think there are some uh, type of applicators out there that are actually a, a cotton rope yeah, that you can wick. use to wick mm -hmm. or to spot spray on them. So whatever technique you would want to use. Right. But that might be what you have to do because the tap roots of those four o'clocks are pretty deep and they will regenerate. But the more carbohydrates of the roots you get out of the ground and, and the leaves you take off the surface, the, the less that there will be in the, in the next time. Right, right. So at the end of the day, it's going to be a lot of work, it's right? It's going to be work. And if you're going to use a chemical, it needs to be a broadleaf weed uh, killer. Or, or it could be glyphosate. glyphosate yeah. right. So just read and follow the label on that. You should be fine. Yeah. But do be careful. All right. Do mm -hmm. be careful. Okay. Thank you for that question. All right, Joel, that was fun. Thank yes, you much. It was. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016 or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about sedums or want to spray your peach trees, we have the information. Just head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.